All right, welcome back to another episode of Revealed Apologetics. I'm your host, Eli Ayala, and today I have another guest uh, with me. Um, last show, I had Dr. Douglas Groteis on to talk um, a little bit about his new book, Christian Apologetics, the second edition, um, which um, I highly recommend. It's a, The first edition is really good, and I'm looking forward to getting into some of the newer portions that Dr. Groteis has added to uh, his already massive work. Uh, but today, um, I have... Um, uh, Dr. Scott Oliphant of Westminster Theological Seminary here with me. He is a professor of apologetics and systematic theology at Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, and of course, those who follow my channel know that we love to talk about presuppositional apologetics. And so uh, I'm happy to have Dr. Oliphant uh, on with me today to talk about that along with some other stuff. And I'm um, looking forward to an exciting um, conversation. So uh, welcome. I know folks are just starting to kind of roll in and and um, and tune in. So if you have any questions, and I'm going to be repeating this uh, throughout the conversation, if you have any questions, uh, Dr. Oliphant has been kind enough to agree to take some questions from uh, the live listening audience. So be sure to preface your question with the word question so that it doesn't get lost in the sea of comments that is uh, usually filling up the comment section as these discussions, uh, you know, uh, go on. So just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest, Dr. Scott Oliphant of Westminster Theological Seminary. How are you doing, Dr. Oliphant? I'm fine. Thanks, Eli. Good to see you. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, it, all the way back when I started this channel, you were like my first kind of like, in my eyes, kind of like, yes, someone, a, a scholar that I can get on and talk about, you know, important issues on presuppositional apologetics because COVID hit. And all the professors were home. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm happy to have you back on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I just apologize to you and your your listeners or viewers or whoever. I, I didn't do video last time. I just am, am not of the age where that was uh, really comfortable for me. Sure. Uh, but since COVID, we've had to do a lot of that. So. So I think we're back in. I think we're good at this point. Right. You look good. You look you look yeah, very thanks. modern with the AirPods. You got the, the <laughs> scholarly beard. You're good. No worries. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what you can do on camera, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. No special effects, no filters, but at any rate. No. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, why don't you tell folks a little bit about yourself in terms of your focus in your, in your scholarship, and then we can kind of go into a little bit about uh, a new book that just came out, and maybe we can kind of take things from there. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I've really been uh, focused uh, on um, apologetics, reform apologetics, um, gosh, for 40 plus years now. Um, it's what drew me to Westminster as a student. Um, I had the uh, the privilege of interacting with Van Til in those early days uh, mm -hmm. through uh, correspondence, letter writing. And then I was living in Texas and he came down to Texas and stayed with us for a few days. And we, we chatted back and forth. So I eventually made my way to Westminster uh, to do a master's degree. And then I, I did a THM after that in apologetics. Uh, Westminster didn't have a doctoral program in apologetics then. So I did a THM in apologetics and wrote my um, master's thesis on a comparison of Cornelius Van Til and Herman Doivier. Um, there, there, there were things in the air at that point about um, who's really transcendental, who's got the transcendental method. And, um, uh, you know, the Jerusalem and Athens sort of brought that out in a pretty big way. And this was this was a bit after that, but it was it was still there. So I did that and then uh, went to pastoral ministry after Westminster back to Texas and then moved back here uh, 1991. So I've been been here since 1991 and, and have tried to, to focus my attention on apologetics and and some theology proper uh, in, in the way that it impacts and, and um, feeds into apologetics as well. Mm. Uh, so you um, interacted, you said uh, you interacted with Dr. Van Til through letter correspondence, not uh -huh. person to person. You kind of just wrote back and forth. Well, we wrote back and forth, and then eventually I wrote him and said, would you mind coming to Texas? And, and uh, you know, we did a kind of a weekend conference with him, um, and he mm -hmm. said, no, I'd be happy to do that. It just so happened his wife had passed away at that point, and he wasn't teaching, so he said, I've got a lot of time. I'm happy to come. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a, a great time. He said, the one condition is you're going to need to take a walk with me each day that I'm there, and I was like, this won't be a problem. The guy was in his 80s. So, but I mean, he would pick him up and put him down. He was, you know, he was in his eighties and he, it was a two mile walk and we were clipping along and he was huffing and puffing and I was 
peppering with questions and uh, it was a great time. I wish I'd had a, a quarter the whole time when I talked. Yeah. I I've always found Dr. Van Til a very interesting person, uh, not just in his thought, but just the kind of person that he was. I, I had a mentor here. Uh, well, I'm in North Carolina now when I was on Long Island, New York, I had a mentor. Uh, he was a pastor, uh, OPC pastor. His name was uh, Bill Shishko. I don't know if you've ever heard sure. of him. Yeah. Yep. Bill Shishko mm -hmm. folks who might think that name is familiar. He actually, uh, he's a, a, a an Orthodox Reformed um, pastor. He debated James White on the topic of baptism, which I thought was an excellent debate if folks oh. are interested in, in looking that up. To be perfectly honest, I'm more of the Baptist persuasion, but I, but I actually think I actually think that Shishko had uh, Dr. White, you know, gave him a run for his money there on that topic. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, Pastor Shishko knew Van Til as well, and um, I was able to con him out of a uh, a copy of the defense of the faith, a signed copy of Antil had given him a while back. And, nice. um, I remember going out to dinner with pastor Shishko and asking him, you know, what kind of person was, was Van Til? Not, not the scholarly stuff, like just the person that he was. And he paused and, and gave it some thought. And he says, you know, wh when I think of the, the type of person Van Til was, he says, I can, I can summarize Van Til in this way. He was a child living in God's world in his father's world. And um, he explained that Van Til, as, as brilliant as he was, um, you know, you, you remove all of the, techni the technical, philosophical, and theological jargon. He really just wanted to live in a world that is understood based upon what God had revealed. He just wanted to believe yeah. his father. Um, and how yeah. that played out had various technical applications given his context. But I thought that was a very yeah. interesting kind of summary of, of Dr. Van Til. You know, if I could just if I could just tell you the story, I think I put this in writing somewhere. But um, when I was going to come to Westminster, I wrote Van Til. I said, it looks like I'm going to be a student at Westminster and I'm excited. I just want to let you know. And he wrote back immediately and he said, when you come look for housing, stay with me. Hmm. So I stayed with him for two weeks in his house here. And 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 again, we had to go on our walk each day. He like he liked to do his daily constitution. And the thing that struck me um and I just remember as a as a youngster, I didn't think I was young, but I was young uh, watching him. Every neighbor that he would introduce me to, and there were three or four, you know, it wasn't like 10 or 20, but three or four different people out. And he would introduce me as he went on his walk. Everyone would say something like this. He's probably talking to you about Jesus, isn't he? Because <laughs> that that was his reputation. His, sure. his, whole neighbor, his whole neighborhood knew. When he's out, if you're going to have a discussion, he's going to talk to you about Jesus. And he would he would visit neighbors um, in the hospital, you know, unannounced and uninvited. He would just go in there with his Bible and and read scripture and and pray with them. And he was just a remarkable. He was he was an evangelist, you know. He was an evangelist, and that's what motivated his apologetic. He, he, as you say, he wanted people to understand Christ is Lord, and uh, our privilege is to serve Him. Yeah. And I think that's so, and before I kind of get into my main questions, I think that's so important because a lot of people who get into the apologetics game, so to speak, we tend to kind of over techna, you know, we over, um, complicate things with technical philosophical concepts and arguments and things like that, that, um, yeah. especially presuppositionalists, we too can be overly philosophical to the exclusion of actually bringing Christ front and center in our discussions with people. So I think that's an important yeah. thing to keep in mind. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, you wrote a book uh, some years back, Covenantal Apologetics, and you had right. a mission. You had a mission to change the terminology from uh, yep. presuppositional apologetics to covenantal apologetics. I'm not sure if you yep. successfully uh, <laughs> accomplished that well, mission. I can tell you this: it works in my classroom because I won't allow them to use the word. But I think <laughs> out, outside of outside of the classroom, and maybe when they graduate, it goes back. I mean, it's it's baked in, so. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, not pretending it'll go away, but, but the reason, the reason I want us together to find some other terminology is because it's ambiguous, hopelessly ambiguous and, and it's philosophical. And Ben Till was not so much about philosophy. Um, he was about scripture and theology. So I think it's better for us to label what we're doing as a theological, biblical process in the first place, which can have philosophical implications. We can do that if we need to, but that's not the gist of it. And, and it, and it may, and it makes it sound like we're concerned about presuppositions. They're concerned about evidence. And as you right. know, presuppositionalists recognize everything evidence is God. So it's a, it's a misnomer. It's ambiguous. It's a big umbrella under which many people uh, want to fit or many people mm -hmm. think they fit. 
And uh, I think Van Til was more unique than that and more consistently reformed than that. So, hmm. like I said, I, people in my class, I say, don't use this when you're in my class. You, whatever you do outside of class is fine, but, but we're not going to use that word. If you want to use reform, that's fine. My preference is covenantal. Anything but this philosophical, ambiguous term uh, works for me. Right. Now, you just said something there that's, that's interesting. You said that uh, presupposition, presuppositionalism, um, I suppose, uh, is an ambiguous term and gives the impression that we're against evidence. We're just all about presuppositions. I think it was yeah. a discussion you had on uh, Unbelievable with, I think it was Kurt Jaros, where okay. you, said, you said something to the effect that presuppositionalists are eminently evidentialist. We're, we're more evidential than the evidentialist because we think literally everything is evidence for God. So I think that's a very yeah, helpful thing to say because exactly. when I was learning presuppositional apologetics, I, I had one foot in presuppositionalism and then I had another foot in classicalism being reared on huh. the, the milk of William Lane Craig's classical arguments. And yeah, so I'm like, yeah. man, I see the value here, but if I'm a presuppositionalist, I can't use any of that. And so I had this kind of, <laughs> this kind of dichotomy set where right. I'm either positionalist or I can use some and there's there is actually helpful ways to marry those and put them within a, a presuppositional context and I think your your comments on on that particular episode of unbelievable was really helpful to me yeah good well you know I hope someday we can band together and, and agree to something else because it just is not helpful to our overall discussion out there for people to think oh you're presuppositional you must be philosophically oriented and talking abstractions and transcendental trans, transcendental ideas and we can do that. Uh, you've had people on to do that. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's useful depending on the argument. But fundamentally, we're meant to be biblical and theological. And so that's what our approach is. And it, it needs to be infused with that content before we move forward to talk about the other. Well, excellent. So so you, you wrote the book Covenantal Apologetics, but you also just came out with a book uh, entitled The Faithful Apologist, Rethinking the Role of Persuasion in Apologetics. Now, um, I think it's available on Audible. I don't know, is the paperback or hard, is there a hardcover paperback available just yet? You know, I wish I knew. Um, it must be available because I had a student bring it to me um, okay. earlier today to sign one. And I, and I told him it's the first time I've seen it. So I guess it's out there, but I'm the last. He's like, I just write the stuff. I don't actually mm -hmm. look at the finished product. <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't know how the process works, but it's got to be out there somewhere because he had one. Okay. All right. Well, well, the audible version is definitely, uh, definitely there. And I was reading the summary uh, on Amazon. There were a couple of things that I caught that caught my eye and I want to see if you can unpack for us here. So in the summary portion on the Amazon page, uh, it says, uh, quote, but too often this takes, and the, this is referring to the act of giving an answer, right? This takes, mm -hmm. um, you know, the apologetic can often feel like we're doing um, PR work for God, limiting our apologetic to a series of strategies and tactics. What does that mean? What what is your what is your opinion on the current state of apologetics um, that it can often feel like that when we're doing it? Yeah, part of that is there are two two sides to that. Um, one side is um, you know I was reflecting on Os Guinness's book Fool's Talk, uh, where he he's interested in persuasion there in that book. And one of the things he says is this is not just uh, this is paraphrasing Os, but this sure. is not just another ad campaign. We're, we're not we're not into marketing and sales. Um, so that's that's part of it. And the other thing that resonated with me in that um, is that when when I was when I was a new Christian and in, in my early days as a Christian, uh, the, the dear people who were discipling me, you know, many of whom are still alive and still dear people. They were Armenian folks and. Uh, they, they might not have known the name, but that's that's kind of the way it was. And so I, I was kind of initially reared on a gospel that needed to be sold um, because it's up to you to convert. You know, mm -hmm. the responsibility is sort of yours to do it. Um, and and I felt I felt that because I was in an evangelistic ministry before I went to seminary. So part of what I'm part of what I'm trying to, to say there is that um there are two sides to persuasion for reformed folk. Okay. One is, as, as the Westminster Confession says, the spirit persuades. He, he works by and with the word uh, to draw people uh, to Christ. Um, the spirit is the primary persuader. And then it's, it's our responsibility, I think, as Christians to conduct ourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. And part of what that means is we want to we want to try to connect with them. We don't want to push them away. Uh, the gospel is going to have its own offense, and we don't want to be 
adding to the offense of the gospel by being offensive ourselves mm. as much as is humanly possible, of course. Sure. So, so in a reformed view, um, we're meant to be persuaders on the human level, recognizing that the Holy Spirit uh, blows where he wills and does what he wants, and he will use the truth of God according to his own sovereign purposes, and the word of God never returns uh, mm -hmm. void to him. So it's it's that kind of idea that I was, I was trying to avoid. Th thinking back on my own personal experience, the beauty of the Reformed faith is in apologetics and preaching and evangelism, we're not the primary instrument. Um, God is and his spirit is. We're the ones used by God. Uh, and it's a blessing to be used by God to draw people to himself, which is done by the Holy Spirit, by and with the word. So mm. it's a great privilege to be involved in that in that kind of ministry. Sure. Now, I definitely want to get back to the issue of the role we play in mm -hmm. apologetics. Obviously, we're the one giving the reason for the hope. Uh, but what is the actual role of the believer uh, as we work in tandem with the working, the mysterious workings of God's regenerative power through the spirit. I want to, I want to return to that a little bit later. Um, but as I was, uh, continuing reading the summary, uh, portion of the book here, um, it says, uh, it also says something really interesting. Um, it says that the book offers a cross centered foundation for Christians to explain their faith in a welcoming and winsome manner that avoids any burden to sell Christianity to non Christians. What do you mean by, uh, a cross-centered foundation. And um, I guess that latter part kind of relates to what you said. We tend to kind of sell Christianity. Uh, we can kind of look like uh, cheap car, car salesmen that turns people off when we're uh, talking about theology and the Christian faith with unbelievers. Yeah. You know, I haven't read what you're reading there, and I'm not sure who wrote it. Um, it's I, I like the way he's put it, or she, whoever wrote it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they they kind of, I'm glad they saw the, the cross slash Christ centered focus of what I was trying to do sure. in, in, in the book. And see what I'm what I'm after in the book uh, is um, try to put it this way. I'm after a sort of basic level audience um, uh -huh. who who probably has not read a whole lot about apologetics, probably doesn't know the various isms out there but it's just interested in what apologetics is and what it means. And so what I'm trying to do in my focus there is to reach that kind of audience without any technicalities at all and to show them what I think is the biblical mode of persuasion, which mm. begins, really begins with the second person of the Trinity, who is the focus of revelation in, in uh, covenant history. It's the second person of the Trinity through whom God is revealed as triune. He, he is the mediator of revelation. And so what, what I do in, in the beginning of the book is just is try to show that how that takes place in the Old Testament. I think sometimes we miss the fact that when the Lord appears in the Old Testament, it's the second person of the Trinity appearing. And then how that how that marches us into the New Testament, where we see when the time had fully come, um, second person of the Trinity now takes on a human nature permanently. So God's condescension I can put it this way, um, God's condescension is the mode of persuasion. Um, he could have shouted the gospel uh, from the skies. He could have dropped leaflets uh, all over the all Chick over tracks, the world. Could have, Chick, Chick tracks. Could have done that. <laughs> yeah, now he could now he could do alerts on our phones. He, there, he has, he has uh, all the means he needs. But what he did is he became one of us in order to com com communicate to us. And he did that in the beginning. To me, this is fascinating, and I'm not sure I, I really hit it as, um, as as crisply as I could in the book, but it's fascinating that God speaks to us. You know, he he speaks to create, and then he condescends to speak to Adam and Eve, and then he speaks in redemptive history through through the Old Testament, and in these last days he's spoken through his son, and now that's finished, and he speaks to us in, in Scripture. So to me, that all, all of that has to do with God's means of persuasion. I'm going to get at your level, Calvin called it the divine stoop. I'm going to condescend to you in order to communicate the truth that you need to know about me. And I, I just think that's a marvelous truth. And, and it helps us understand something about what persuasion is. Mm. Now, this person who wrote this summary mentioned that the book offers a cross-centered apologetic um, or a, a cross-centered foundation. Um, and of course, you didn't write that, but I'm sure you would agree that that's what you were going for. So my, my next question is, what, what what does it mean to say that an apologetic 
is cross-centered? What, what does a Christocentric apologetic look like? And why do you think, say, for example, um, presuppositionalism offers that um, to believers? The thing that attracted me to, um, to Van Til's approach initially um, was, like I said, I was involved in an evangelistic ministry, wonderful ministry, actually. Um, and I'm thankful for my involvement there and, and for the fruit of that ministry, not just when I was there, but overall. Um, but what drew me to, to, to Van Til, um, as I was reading him and trying as best I could to understand him and writing him letters to ask, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Um, what drew me to it is that it, I, I could see at least this much that what he was doing was inextricably linked to the gospel. Hmm. And the way I had learned apologetics, uh, even in a, in a minimal way, I wasn't a student of apologetics, but I'd read some apologetics in, 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 uh, because of my ministry I was in. The way I'd learned it was my job would be to um, prove theism. And then, and then if I wanted to, I could move from that to the gospel. That seemed, even as a youngster, that seemed uh, to uh, to bifurcate things that ought not be uh, separated. Um, okay. And then when I'm reading Van Til, I'm seeing that he's moving us inexorably toward what he called Christian theism. So it's not just generic theism. Um, it's Christian theism. And so what I think what makes uh, this approach, this Reformed approach, cross-centered is that we're defending the Christian faith and not just some notion that God is immutable, unchangeable, infinite, eternal, which of course he is, all of those things. But that's meant to move us. That truth is meant to move us to the triune God. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you've got this notion in the, in the Roman Catholic catechism that Muslims and Catholics, as they put it, adore the same God. Well, that's a, that's a serious problem. Um, number one, it would mean that both are idolaters um, because it's not the true God. But the reason it's the same is because you have the attributes listed in the same way. And part of the reason for that is because of Thomas's the dependence on, on Muslims and, and on Aristotle. That's not, that's not Christian theism. Christian theism is this kind of God who then condescends to us to speak and to tell us who he is. And, it, and, and so our apologetic needs to lead as best we're able inexorably mm -hmm. to, to the gospel itself and to the cross of Christ as the only solution to our sin problem. So I have some friends who are um, pretty noted classical apologists, and, and mm -hmm. I've, I've run some ideas like this by them, and they would tell me, I'm trying to demonstrate Christianity. That doesn't mean I have to provide one argument that concludes the Christian God. What's wrong with me offering some arguments that demonstrate that the God I'm trying to demonstrate has certain features as part of a broader case? Because classical apologists, um, as the cherry on top of their arguments, depending on the proposition of the debate, right? Does God exist? Right. We'll hear the traditional proofs. Um, the, the cherry on top of the cake it, are the historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. So while it's true that demonstrating that God is transcendent, perhaps the transcendent cause of the universe, a, a Muslim could affirm that. Um, the classical apologist wouldn't say, well, I'm going to stop there. I believe it is the Christian God. And not every evangelical apologist agrees with the Catholic that Muslims and Catholics worship the same God. Right. So how would you speak to a classical apologist who says, hey, I'm trying to demonstrate Christian theism, but I'm, I'm doing it step by step where you're, you think you can do it and as like a whole, not all power to you, but don't say I'm trying to demonstrate the existence of some generic God. I want to get to Christian theism. How would you speak to someone like that? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say a couple of things here. I, I don't want to give the impression that there's something wrong with uh, discussing theism. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to say is if we're, if we, Christian apologists are going to discuss theism, we have to recognize that our epistemological foundation for that is God's revelation mm -hmm. and not some uh, rational construct or, or not some uh, mutually agreeable rational principle, since, mm -hmm. since those don't exist, mutually agreeable ones. So when, I'm, when I was writing Covenantal Apologetics, one of the things I did in one of the chapters is I took an actual dialogue uh, between a uh, uh, a classical apologist and a humanist. I took that actual dialogue and, and, and the apologist was giving the cosmological argument. Everything comes to be as a cause. The universe came to be there for God, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the humanist, the humanist um, uh, five times in that, it was a real discussion, five times in that discussion, the, human the humanist says to the 
classical apologist, how do you know that God did not come to be? And you can read his answers in, in the book, um, but, but, he, but he can't get to the answer. What he, what he does is repeat the, repeat the structure of the thing. How do you know that God did not come to be? Well, everything comes to be in the cause. How do you know that God did not come to be? And on and on he goes, and he never got an answer. So, so that, sh that shows, I think, that there's an epistemological gap in, in, in a sort of classical approach, because then what I do in the book in Covenant on Paul is I reconstruct that very argument in a, in a way, not the only way, but a way that a reformed um, covenantal apologist would use it. And, and what I begin to do then is, is to, when the how do you know question comes, you know, the way I set it up in that mock dialogue, when the how do you know question comes, I say, well, the only way I can know is because God has told me who he is and what he's mm -hmm. like. In other words, you, you've got to be, I think, clear and quick if needed to get to your foundation so that the people that you're speaking to will understand from what authority you do speak. If you don't go to your foundation, which is God's revelation, then the impression is going to be given, I'm speaking from my own authority or from the authority that we share together by virtue of our rationality or something like that. That's not what apologetics is meant to be or meant to do. So, so we, we, we need not ever be embarrassed or ashamed or reticent to say, I, I'm standing on scripture because unless I do, I've got nothing to say to you. Mm -hmm. um, I, and, and what I say to you is not because I'm the authority here. It's because Christ is, and he's spoken to me in his word, and he's told me what God is like. And I just think that is, um, that, that's, that's a world apart from much, not always, much of what happens in, in classical apologetics. You probably know the situation better than I do, but the story of Anthony Plew, mm -hmm. you know, he eventually became uh, somewhat uh, kind of theistic. Uh, but he could never get over the suffering uh, issue. And, and that's, that's a hard one. There's no question. Problem of evil is difficult. But, but one of the ways you can, you can talk about that in an apologetic context is to say, here's, here's what God has done about the suffering. Hmm. Uh, he came and he suffered. Uh, so he's not, he's not aloof from it. And in his plan, he planned that he would actually undergo it. So it's that important to him as well. And now you've got a cross-centered apologetic. Maybe it doesn't answer everything the person wants to ask, but it answers everything they need to know sure. in order to understand what God thinks about suffering. He took it on himself. Hmm. Um, you, you, can't, you can't do that if you're, if you're so boxed in, on, in, in kind of a theistic context. Um, it's not, you're, not gonna th you're not gonna think I've got the leeway to go there immediately because you're gonna think this really does mess up my argument. And in that, in that actual dialogue in Covenant Apologetics, you see how that works. I mean, the, the, you know, the classical apologist, he just can't, he just can't go there. He's got to stay with his, what he thinks is his, his mutual rational principle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so when we take, for example, um, the Kalam cosmological argument, whatever begins to exist as a cause, the universe began to exist. Therefore the universe has a cause. You got the fine tuning argument, these kind of traditional classical proofs. Does the presuppositionalist have any use for those? What does it look like? Uh, to a pre because we often give lip service as reform folks like hey we don't agree with the the classical approach but there there's some great insights that we could still benefit from and is that just kind of tipping our hat or are there great insights that the presuppositionalists can 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 use from the classical approach how does and this is, this is a question i don't know if this is something that is spoken about in methodological debates at the scholarly level but at the popular level this is a huge question how yeah. do we marry presuppositionalism and those evidences and classical arguments? I mean, is it just garbaggio or is there a fruitful way to kind of bring them together and provide a very potent, uh, cumulative, presuppositional-esque approach uh, to present to the unbeliever? Yeah. And I think that's just a great question. And I think it, it it's legitimately kind of a burning question out there and mm -hmm. we all need to do more work on it. One of the reasons I did the the dialogue format in covenantal apologetics and, and created a mock dialogue. I did two or three of those throughout the book. I did a dialogue with a Mus Muslim and, and this one was a dialogue with a humanist. And, and one of the reasons I did that, and I tried to make clear in the book, cause I said it repetitively, this is only one way to do it. It could be done other ways, but I wanted, I wanted to, to show, uh, of course, those, those arguments can be used. You know, Ventil uses Bavink's language to say the theistic proofs are all objectively valid. 
And what that means is um, they have their own validity, but, but what's not considered oftentimes, or, or if it is considered, it's considered um, in a theologically different way than we would consider it, is the state of the person to mm-hmm. whom you speak. Um, in, 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 um, as you know, in a, in a typical Arminian uh, context, there's a ration, there's meant to be, they think, a rational mutuality so that um, when you're speaking to someone about cause and effect, your, your supposition is we mean the same thing by that. There's no difference okay. in the way I think about it and the way the unbeliever thinks about it. So, um, so yes, I would say um, Reformed apologists, covenantal apologists, your kind, what you're talking about, um, the word which must not be said, um, that, that kind of apologist can use uh, any of those arguments to good effect, but always within the context of a revelational foundation. That is, we, we have to know what our principium is, what our mm-hmm. basic source is for the information we're giving, so that uh, you know, this was Bertrand Russell's, you know, quagmire, as, as he put it. The reason he couldn't be a Christian is because you get the cosmological argument and, you know, the universe came to be there for God. OK, who made God? Well, that sounds like a stupid question to us. It's a it's a natural question to ask, given the premises and structure of that kind of cause effect argument. Mm-hmm. On what basis do you stop then with God? And you could say, well, I stop on the basis of my definition of God. Okay, good. Where'd you get that definition? Is that something here? You get it because that's what you think about God? Or do you get that definition or understanding of God from somewhere else? And for us, we would say, look, we have to get our understanding of God from what God has said, because the distance is so great. We wouldn't know him unless he condescended to reveal himself Mm -hmm. to us. And he's done that. He's done that in natural revelation. He's done that particularly in special revelation. So all of those arguments, I think, can be very useful. But when the when the epistemological question comes, and it doesn't have to be called that, but when the question comes, how do you know, then we need to say how we know. Well, I know because God has said so. That's how I know. And by the way, that's the only way you're you're going to be able to know as well, because that's right. that's who we are and that's who God is. Mm. All right. Excellent. Again, that that's a topic that I, I I wasn't even planning to ask those questions, but that could open up another another discussion that I think is an important one. But uh, I'm going to try to stay focused. So, uh, all right. So uh, your book, um, Apologetics and Persuasion, you're obviously coming from uh, a reformed perspective right now. I don't yes. know if you're familiar with this, but on the interwebs, there are all sorts of theological traditions that are employing um, a presuppositional approaches. Uh, so, for example, I have seen um, some Roman Catholics floating around using presuppositionalism in interesting ways. And Eastern Orthodoxy, um, there is a very strong emphasis on presuppositional forms of argumentation. There's a very well-known uh, Eastern Orthodox um, fellow on YouTube. His name is Jay Dyer. And he uses mm-hmm. transcendental arguments along the lines of, um, you know, the way Bonson would use it. Um, so, uh, my question then, um, because you present a Reformed apologetic, what is the relationship between Reformed theology and presuppositional apologetics? Is that relationship a necessary one or an accidental one? It's it's just Van Til developed a system out of certain <clears throat> Reformed assumptions that he had, but they're not necessarily connected. Why don't you unpack that for us? Yeah, well, this goes back to kind of my passion um, when, uh, again, when I was a when I was a fairly young Christian living in Texas, a, a well-known apologist came to town to speak, and I had the opportunity to chat with him afterwards. And uh, his name's not important; everyone would know it, but um, it, wa- it wasn't Sproul, but it was somebody that people would know. And so I had a chance to, to meet with him um, and just started talking to him about apologetics. And I I was pretty sure where I was at that point, but I wasn't. You know, I hadn't been at it very long. So he asked me in the middle of it, he said, are you, are you presuppositional? And I said, yeah, I am. And he said, so tell me, are you Carnelian or Clarkian or Schaeferian or Vantillian, you know, and, and, or Henryan, you know, so he gives me this list and, and, and light bulbs went off in my head. And I thought, I don't like the word if it's a big umbrella under which people fit who would have pretty, pretty significant disagreements uh, among themselves. So it was one of the is one of the clues to me that we've got to do better than that. So that's all to say, um, yeah, a lot of folks can be presuppositional. A lot of folks can do transcendental. Um, 
my concern, my interest is in a is in a deeply reformed uh, apologetic, and and I think that's what I think that was the genius of Van Til. I think that's what he helped us do. He he would have said to to us um, today if he were here, um, he would have said, "You guys need to remember, I'm just." I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants. Sure. The way you put it to me, I'm a pygmy standing on shoulders of giants. I'm not, I'm not a giant at all. I've just got these people underneath me. That's, that's what he said. And I think he believed that with all his heart. He would not have done what he did without, without Calvin, without Kuiper, without Bobbing, to some extent, Hodge and Warfield. So, so that's why I think that the term itself is not helping what we want to promote um, and, and we need to we need to be as clear as we can that if you're going to to think about apologetics as we see it in a biblically consistent way, you need to think about it as infused with reform theology. The reform reform theology has got to be at the base of our apologetic method or we're going to go wrong in various ways. And that, you know, that was that was Van Til's uh, debate discussion with Gordon Clark, uh, with uh, with Carnell and others. Um, so, so I, I would say, um, again, yes, you, you can fit people into various presuppositionalisms or transcendental methods or approaches, but my question would be, what's the theology driving that apologetic, if you're going to call it presuppositional? Yeah. And no. So perhaps I could ask even, even a more refined question. So yes, I, I agree with you, um, that we need to have kind of uh, reform theology is the soil out of which our apologetic flows. I, I get that. Yes. But is it possible for you to pinpoint certain specifics of reform theology that is just essential? Like, Hey, this is a unique feature that we see in reform theology. That's not seen in these other theologies. And it's this important piece is very important in consistently using a presuppositional approach. Yeah, I think so. Um, First is what we've already discussed, that God is the one who saves sinners, and, and he does it uh, monergistically. Um, he, he, the spirit works fine with the word. You, you've, got to, you've got to have that view of things if, if you're going to do apologetics. Otherwise, you think you're really the instrument, sure. the instrumental cause in that. Um, and then downstream from that, we have to recognize that, that depravity is total, um, that, that it's not partial that we're not just sick people who need medicine. We're dead people at the bottom of the ocean who need resurrection. And then I think, um, you know, when, when you get to the, you know, to the, to the fine points of this, I think focally um, Calvin's insistence uh, picked up by Kuiper Bob Inc. and emphasized by Van Til and a lot of the reformed actually in the 16th, 17th century, Calvin's in- emphasis on the sense of Venetatis is key for our understanding of what we're doing in apologetics, because we we have to go into these discussions recognizing that the people to whom we speak know the God of whom we speak. They, they don't just have this um, ambiguous notion of happiness or blessedness as, as Thomas would have have us understand Romans one, but it's but it's actually known to stone they own. It's actually Romans one twenty one. It's knowing God. Um, and that's and that's what Paul wants to set out. And I was just in my class this morning in a second year apologetics class. We're also going through the prologue of the Gospel of John, uh, taking off from Gerhardus Voss's good study on that, where he makes it clear, I think, correctly that that the second person of the Trinity has been the revealer from the beginning and that the light that enlightens every man is actually the knowledge of God. So you combine the prologue with Romans one and what you have, I think, is a biblical certainty that you never go to anyone uh, who is a tabula rasa. Every person who is self-conscious by virtue of their self-consciousness is at the same time God conscious. And that's a dynamic, active thing working external to them and within them, Romans 2, the works of the law written on the heart, so that what what you're wanting to do in your apologetic, this is the persuasion part of it, is you're wanting to reach in to that, census divinitatis and connect with it so that the spirit might use it for its own sovereign purposes, but our prayer would be use it for conversion. Um, that, that seems to me, it, it, you, you've got to have those things in place if you're going to be presuppositional. You, it's got to be informed by that brand, if I can put it that way, of Reformed theology that has that strong emphasis on the census divinitatis, which was Calvin's genius, really, and was picked up by the other reform. Would you I think equate, that's massively important. 
Would you equate Calvin's census divinitatis with kind of the notion of like innate knowledge of God, just to innate knowledge? Yeah, I mean, there was, you know, there were there were debates about that discussions because the notion of innate looked Cartesian back in the day. And, and, and so if you use the word, you've got to define it. What the, what our uh, forefathers would call it is a cognitio incita, meaning an implanted knowledge. And I like implanted better because it, 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 in one sense, it means it's from the outside in it's put in there by God. And that's really Paul's emphasis. Uh, We know God because God has made himself known. We don't know God because we construct some sort of theological structure concluding Mm. that God exists. We know God because God inserts his knowledge into us. And and that's something that, you know, so many even Reformed Christians don't get. They don't get the clarity of what what Paul's giving us here. There's there been discussions, uh, Eli, you may know about these on you know, what, what do we think about natural revelation, natural theology, all that kind of thing. And those are helpful discussions. But before we get into that discussion, we need to define our terms. Sure. The way I define natural revelation is that's what God does. God does in, in and through all that he has made. Natural theology is what we do with what God does. Mm-hmm. So some some of our Reformed forebears wanted to call natural theology the census divinitatis. They called that natural theology because any knowledge of God for them is natural theology. I think that confuses the issue. I don't like I don't like that dis, um, that distinction. So I want to say that doesn't mean it's wrong. I just think it gets confusing. I want to say natural revelation, God's activity, natural theology, what I do with that. So so yeah. God puts His knowledge into us by and through the things that He's made, and that. That's, you know, that's comprehensive. That's internal. That's external. That's always, it's dynamic. It's 24 seven. It never ends. Okay. So I have two questions then, because this idea of implanted knowledge, I think is uh, very fascinating. And I think this comes up a lot when presuppositionalists are defending presuppositional claims against other competing apologetic methodologies. A lot of people really zero in, well, you know, what do you mean by implanted knowledge? How do you defend that scripturally? Um, What is a go-to scripture that we could use or scriptures that we can use that you think most strongly um, defends the idea of implanted knowledge. Is it just Romans one? Uh, uh, Did we, they know God. Um, are there any, any other passages that we can kind of go to, to show? Yeah, there, we know the God that created us. Um, the very fact that we're conscious of ourselves, we must simultaneously be conscious of, of, of God as, as Calvin would suggest. Yeah, I think I think Romans one is is the best one for us. Um, okay. Again, I think the the, the the prologue, Gospel John, the light that enlightens every man. Um, that's the true light that enlightens every person. That that's uh, Voss thinks, and I think correctly. That's the knowledge of God uh, given to us through the medium of the second person of the Trinity from the beginning of creation all, all the way mm-hmm. forward. Um, he's the one working. But when when Paul says in 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 in, in one twenty. Um, that we know God's invisible attributes and his, de- his deity, his theotes, his divinity, however you want to translate that word. What, what Paul's wanting us to recognize is that there is, it, this is not just, you know, ethereal kind of opaque, ambiguous. This is real knowledge, personal knowledge of the personal God. And then, and then I think if we, so let's take that as, as Paul's basic dictum when it comes to uh, what I call the anatomy of unbelief, you know, the, the, the psychology, if we can etymologize that, the soul knowledge that people have by virtue of being the image of God. And if we had time, we could go into Paul's referencing Genesis 1 to 3 and Romans 1. He's got that in mind while he's thinking about the wrath of God being revealed. But if we take that and move to, to Paul, to that, that famous um, uh, occasion in, in Athens, Paul at Athens, What's he doing in, at Athens? Well, he he begins his 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 declaration, this proclamation, as he puts it, uh, this God that you don't know, I proclaim to you. He begins with some what we would think are some of the most difficult aspects of God's character. He begins with his aseity. He begins with his sovereignty. He begins with the creation of Adam, and from one man, every other person comes by virtue of Adam's covenant head. Difficult things. In this, in this culture, you know, Schaefer called this uh, people without the Bible. This is a culture of people without the Bible, more or less. So Paul begins there, and then he quotes the two poets. Um, again, uh, Aquinas says he quotes the poets because he's, you know, they've got it about half right. That's not what Paul's thinking. 
Um, why does he quote the poets? In him you live and move and exist. Uh, we are his offspring. That's that's the persuasion point. See, Paul knows, I guarantee you, Paul knows the people that he's speaking to, they know God. So he's appealing to their knowledge of God at Athens in this proclamation. They say he's unknown. Paul said, no, he isn't. I'm going to tell you why. Here's what he's like. You know, God who made heaven and earth doesn't need anything, doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands, etc. cetera. Uh, this is who the true God is. And he says, even some of your own poets have said this. Now, then the question is, when, uh, let's say, Epimenides says, in him you live and move and exist, is that proposition true? In him you live and move and exist. I ask my, I ask my class this every year, and I, and, and I get blank stares because they think it might be a trick question, and it kind of might be a trick question. So is, <laughs> is it true? Is it true, in him you live and move and exist? When Epimenides wrote it, it's false. Because the him is Zeus. It's a false right. proposition. Paul's made it true by pouring the biblical Christian theistic content into the statement so that when he uses it, he also translates it into a Christian context. So, And the people listening to him would have known that. He's already set up the one he's speaking about. And then when he used their statements, it's a point of persuasion. It's something they already mm. know, something many of them would have affirmed. But now it's got completely different Christian theistic content. Into sort of it. like what the Apostle John is doing in John 1. Uh, in the beginning exactly. was the word. Logos. So he, yeah. Okay, yeah. Exactly okay. Right. right. Yeah, that word was around and in the air and, and had been around for a few hundred years before Paul, before John even wrote it. Mm -hmm. And the Lord inspires the, the, uh, the Apostle John to take it and use it and give it completely different content. He was in the beginning and he was with God and he was God. And by the way, he sure. became flesh. I mean, yes. it's just a remarkable passage, rich passage for, for us and for apologetics. So I think, I think that's the point of, that that's where we see persuasion in its sort of in its panoramic view uh, in the new Testament. You know, I had a, I had a guy say to me one time, I was speaking to a Presbyterian group and, and I did a little bit on Romans one and he raised his hand and he says, you know, all you guys have is, is, is Romans one. Is that, is that all you've got? You know, it just, you just keep using this and using this. And, uh, and I said to him, because I was in Florida, I said to him, uh, let me quote R.C. Sproul to you uh, okay. in another context, but the same quote, how many times does God have to say it for it to be true? So, <laughs> you know, Sproul had used that before, and I, and I used that when it came to Romans 1. And the fact is, um, you know, Scripture says it elsewhere, and you can piece together uh, other, other passages of Scripture. I think Psalm 19, you know, Paul's thinking about that as he's writing in Romans 1, uh, mm -hmm. the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, day to day, pour forth speech, night to night, reveal knowledge. All of that is God revealing and giving in and through everything that's made. And Paul ensures us that when God does this, it gets through. It doesn't bounce off. He implants it. Uh, it's plain to us because God made it plain to us, Romans 1, 19. So mm -hmm. we, we know that it's there because God makes sure that it's there and God doesn't fail in his task. So it's, I, I think unless you've got that as kind of your central focus with the gospel, you know, um, context and, and, and the knowledge of God is your central focus, you're sure. going to miss what a, what a true reformed covenant apologetic is. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking with Dr. Scott Oliphant of Westminster Theological Seminary, professor of apologetics and systematic theology. Um, again, folks who are listening in, there are some questions already coming in, but if you have a question for Dr. Oliphant, please preface your question with the word question, and um, um, he'll tackle those at the back end of this episode. Now, a question um, on innate knowledge. So a lot of people ask this. So yes, or, or implanted knowledge. Yes, all men have a knowledge of God, non teston theon. Yes, they know the God. But what is the content of that implanted knowledge? How much of the knowledge of God does man have? And can we go further than just simply saying enough to condemn him? That's true. But um, people say, you know, do people know that God is triune? Um, if not, and we have kind of just a limited knowledge of God enough to condemn us, then what's wrong with the natural theological arguments, which kind of show that, you know, we can deduce the sort of God that everyone kind of has a, an internal conception of within their own rational thought categories. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So just to your latter point, let me, let me just say again, and I, I think you agree with me here. There's nothing wrong with the natural theological arguments. Okay. They're okay. objectively valid. The question is how are we going to use them and, and where do we stand when we use them? Um, okay. So, 
if we stand on God's revelation when we use those arguments and we are sure in our discussion that the import of what we say and the content of what we're saying is informed by God's revelation in scripture, then go ahead and use them and, and work with them. Just remember the epistemological foundation on which you stand in order to do that, because if you move away from that, as Ben Till would put it, you're on quicksand. And, and the only way you can stand on something firm is by standing on God's revelation. So, so could a presuppositionalist use a cosmological argument with the background knowledge that we wouldn't, this argument wouldn't work at all without the Christian concept, but for the purposes of the nature of the discussion, they kind of throw that argument and kind of have a conversation with the unbelievers. Is there a place for that? Um, because a lot of people think if you're doing presuppositional apologetics, even when you're using evidence, it has to look starkly different than what these classical guys are doing over here. What, what does that look like? Yeah, again, I don't think it has to look starkly different. I just think let's, um, you know, even even Cajetan, the commentator of Aquinas, he said, you know, Thomas's proofs um, uh, bump up against the ceiling of creation. They, they can't you can't jump in a cause effect argument in the way that it's laid out classically. And let's just mm -hmm. say Thomistically, you don't have within the argument. So I'm trying to be careful here. You don't have within the argument anything that allows you to jump to eternity and infinity and immutability. Thomas just says this, we call God. And so if people say yes and amen, okay, fine. But just recognize you've imported massive content into the argument that's not there in the argument mm. itself. So okay. if we're going to use, if we're going to use a cause and effect argument, we, we're going to have to get to the point where we say God caused the universe. Yes, right. And that does not mean that he's subject to time or space in his causing it. All right. Okay. So we don't we can't just. Re so now we're talking about a different kind of cause. aren't we? And we right. have to acknowledge that or at least know that going in so that if we're questioned who caused God. Oh, by the way, God is the only one uncaused. He is who he is, period, mm -hmm. the end. So we, we just have to be I think we have to be, you know, Van Til's phrase. We just always have to be epistemologically self-conscious when we engage in these kinds of things so that we recognize from what foundation we speak. If we if we lose that. Um, we're going to lose the biblical import of what we're doing. God may honor it anyway. Uh, there have been successful natural theological arguments from from other theological persuasions. We thank the Lord for that. I used to preach. I used to preach an Armenian gospel, and the Lord used it anyway. So that's not the point. The point is, we we need to be as biblically faithful as we're able to be, uh, given what God has said to us. Mm -hmm. So. So I think I think that's the direction we need to go. I forget the first part of your question. I had an answer for it. Um, I said um, with respect to the content of that implanted knowledge, how, how much yeah. of God, of the true God do we know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I would say um, Charles Hodge is really good here in his commentary on Romans. Um, he says, in effect, you know, when Paul wants to give us a list of things, he'll give us a list and he'll make a long list. He does that at the end of Romans. I mean, you've got a long list there of what people are full of. You know, Paul says you're full of this because God's given you over. Um, but in, in Romans, in Romans 120, we don't have a list. We have two categories, uh, eternal power and, and theotes, the divine nature, divinity, the godness of God. So it's his eternal power and his godness. And Hodge says um, he He's of the opinion, I think he's correct here, that, that Paul, if he wanted to give us a list, he would have, since we don't have a list, we ought to include, uh, Hodge says, all the divine perfections. Now, that doesn't mean all of them are always uh, in us in the same way at the same time. It's not like God just sort of dumps all the divine perfections into our soul, and there it is, and there it stays. Because the point that um, Paul's making there is that the wrath of God is being revealed. There's this dynamic of revelation. Again, back to Psalm 19, day to day, pour forth speech, night to night reveal. There's a dynamic going on so that we're knowing God truly and perhaps in different ways at different times in the world. So when there's a tragedy in a, in a life of an unbeliever, they want to know God as a forgiving father, even if they're not Christians. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, when things are happening now in, in Ukraine with Russia, you've got all kinds of people that surprise you by saying we need to be in prayer. Mm. So so they know God in, in that way. It's, you know, so that, that you see in the census of Anitatis, I've used the example. I'm not the only one, but I've used the example of a beach ball trying to hold it underwater. And sometimes that ball is going to pop up. 
And sure. and a lot of times it, in times of tragedy, that ball pops up and people say, we need to be in prayer about this or, or something mm-hmm. like that. And I think the beach ball is popping up when, when Epimenides says in him, we live and move and exist. He's got the wrong reference. It's not Zeus. But why even say something? Like, why have this overarching in him kind of idea? That's the census of Benetatis. So I think it's it's eternal power. It's divine nature. People know that they are creatures of God. And Paul's point is you ought to honor him and you ought to give thanks. You ought to be doing those things. You know enough that you ought to honor God. You ought to worship him. You ought to bow the knee to him. You ought to be thankful. Mm-hmm. But instead you become foolish in your speculations. Your foolish hearts are dark and professing to be wise. You become fools. That's mm-hmm. what suppression looks like. But it's, but you can't suppress what you don't have. So it's suppression of the truth. That's always there. And because we're covenantally qualified, either in Adam or in Christ, that knowledge will always be there in this life and the next. Mm. So that hell is the reality of me shaking my fist at the one who gave me life and breath and all things while I existed here. It's the knowledge of the wrath and justice of God, new heavens, new earth, knowledge of the grace and mercy of God. Mm. All right. Excellent. Now I have two questions. One is well, my last question on uh, implanted knowledge. And then my other question is, is, is um, related to uh, reform theology uh, and the role of persuasion uh, in doing apologetics. So uh, my, la- my last question on, on implanted knowledge is what is the nature um, of, we, we, we say that all men know that God exists. That, that means Everyone is included. Everyone has a sufficient knowledge of God for their damnation, right? We would, we would agree with that, right? Yeah. Okay. So what is the nature of a newborn baby's knowledge? Um, when you have someone who hasn't even, you know, fully developed mentally, what is the, does it, does an, a, a newly born baby have a knowledge of God enough to damn them? And like, you know, how does that work? Um, is it, is it the fact that they have a knowledge of God, but they lack the rational capacities to um, uh, formalize it into like language? What is the nature of a baby's knowledge of God? Yeah, and I think those are fun questions. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us much information about okay. that. Um, I, I think um, that's why I like to say, and I think Ben Till says this somewhere I just read recently, um, along with Calvin, to the extent you're self-conscious, you're God-conscious. And and in my own view, um, I had a discussion about this a while back, a good while back now, with a particular philosopher who was kind of upset that I was saying this knowledge doesn't have to be propositional. Mm-hmm. I don't think it does at all. There's much more going on in knowledge than, than simply propositions. An example uh-huh. I've used is um, when my one of my uh, granddaughters uh, was three months old, uh, she and her um, her siblings and mom were living with us for a while because um, my son-in-law was deployed. He was in the Navy. So um, he was, the, so this granddaughter was born in our home and, and in, in a few months was just kind of being reared here. When she was three months old, I would walk in the door and she would smile and get excited. Um, that's knowledge. And I don't know what kind it is. I don't know what's going on in her brain, but she knew me and she was actually, you're going to you know, be surprised. She was excited to see me. So um, that's, that's a, that's, that's baby. If knowledge. you came through my door, I'd be excited to see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, yeah. So I think, I think scripture's not um, wanting to deal with that question, except to say um, God knows what people know and how much they know. And, and Paul's writing to a group of people with an ideal sort of an ideal adult in view, a typical Roman, as he writes to the Roman church in view here, Roman pagan. Uh, and, and yeah, it'll, it'll filter down um, in various ways to children. Uh, but again, to the extent they're self-conscious, they're God-conscious. And if, if you, if you have children, I had children, you know that when they're very young, the, the big questions start to come, even if they're not provoked. The questions about heaven, questions about God, questions about life. So kids are getting that already. And that, I think, is, a, is, is, is an example of the census divinitatis at work. Hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Now, I have one last question on my end, and then we'll move to some uh, live questions. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this conversation. I am. Uh, I, I love how you, you, you explain some of the things that are floating around in my mind and questions that I hear. So I appreciate that. Uh, but here's my, here's my personal last question before we kind of shift to some of the uh, audience questions. So uh, some folks from other apologetic schools of thought who are perhaps more critical of Reformed theology might say something along the lines of, 
if Calvinism slash determinism, so a deterministic form of Calvinism is true, what's the point of being persuasive in apologetics? It's ultimately up to God anyway. Whether you're persuasive or not, it is God who's going to have to produce regeneration in the heart of the unbeliever anyway. So God can use unpersuasive means to accomplish his task in evangelism and apologetics because it's really up to God to turn the spiritual regeneration switch on. So in essence, are we to be persuasive as reformed folks simply because God commands us to, or does persuasiveness actually play an important role in how we communicate with unbelievers? That's my question. Yeah. Um, really good question. I, 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 I'm, I don't have a lot of patience with caricatures of Reformed theology because they've all been addressed somewhere. And so when I hear a caricature, it tells me right away somebody doesn't know uh, much about the, the view that I believe. Um, and, you know, the, kind of the standard view, if you're a Calvinist, God is the author of sin, as if, as if the uh, Calvinists had never thought about that. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting objection. No, it's right there in the, in the middle of the Westminster Confession when they're talking about right. the decree and no, no Calvinist has ever thought that. And there's a certain sense in which no Calvinist has ever been a determinist. Um, we, we certainly do affirm that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass. Nothing comes to pass except that he has first ordained it. But we also have affirmed in reformed uh, thinking um, really it goes farther back, doesn't it? But we're just talking here about reform thought. We've also affirmed that, um, that we are responsible creatures. Uh, in Adam, we're responsible. In Christ, we're responsible. And so we're responsible um, to be involved in what God has called us to do. And uh, God can use any means uh, he wants to, to convert people. I heard someone one time say that they were converted by way of a study of Buddhism. And what mm -hmm. they recognized was there's something wrong here. And that moved them over to uh, to think about Christianity. So mm -hmm. God used Buddhism, but we don't want to we don't want to use that in our politics. We don't want to, you know, hype Buddhism so that people can go to Christianity and learn something else. So what the Lord has ordained is that we would be involved in in our preaching, in our evangelism, in our apologetics. We would be instruments that he would use to bring his own people to himself. None of that happens accidentally. None of it happens randomly. N nothing is contingent to God, as the confession says. All of it's according to his plan. But he's planned that he would use the likes of us in preaching evangelism and apologetics in order to bring people to himself. So, you know, I've had people say to me, you probably have too, um, you know, they sort of come and say, uh, oh, by the way, no one was ever argued into the kingdom. And I say to them, exactly right. And let me just uh, help you here. No one was ever preached into the kingdom. No one was ever evangelized into the kingdom until and unless the truth of God is used by the spirit of God to change hearts of people. And that's what the spirit does. He's chosen to use us in that mm -hmm. process. And we're meant to be biblical in the way that we present the gospel. And I'm not saying there's only one way to do it. There are various ways to do it but we're meant to be Christ-like in the way that we do it. And one of the things that I do in the book is I use a couple of the examples of Jesus talking to the Pharisees and the Jews and show how persuasive he is in using their own words against them in some cases, but also drawing them in by saying, oh, this is what you believe. Well, guess what? You've got to believe this as well. So, you know, the, the, the point here is uh, if someone thinks Calvinism means that our involvement is meaningless and useless, they just don't know what Calvinism is. It's a caricature. It's nothing that Calvinists have ever believed. Right. All right. Well, thank you for that. You are doing an excellent job and uh, we're making good time. And uh, we're going to move to the question, uh, the audience questions. There's a okay. couple here. We'll, we'll go kind of a shotgun speed. You don't feel like you have to rush through them, uh, but don't right. feel like you have to give kind of a, a long explanation too. So some of them are pretty short. Some of them will require a little bit of unpacking, but uh, you know, let's, let's try to get through as, as many as possible. I'm, I really appreciate when folks ask questions and it's very helpful. It's there. It's Good. the opportunity for folks to kind of interact. So uh, first question here is uh, from Scott Terry. Thank you so much for your question. Did Dr. Oliphant ever meet Greg Bonson and did they ever have any interaction? You know, um, I did meet Greg. He he came to um, he came to Westminster uh, one time um, and wanted to uh, interact with our faculty 
uh, on the Theonomy book that was written. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that book, Theonomy, a critique. It was edited by Barker and Godfrey. And and uh, Greg uh, called and wanted to wanted to join the faculty, interact with it back and forth. And he did that. And and uh, in those days, um, as as today, there there weren't any theonomists on faculty, so it was a it was a lively exchange. Um, <laughs> but lively. Um, it was lively. Um, but you know, I, I don't think any, either side was convinced of the other. Um, but Greg and I just didn't have a lot of opportunity to interact um, much. He was he was in California. I was here. Um, and then he, uh, you know, died rather suddenly. Um, I, I, I will say, um, it's a kind of interesting anecdotal, cool. um, the, the book Van Til's apologetic that Greg, that Greg wrote, um, sure. where he, where he compiled, you know, so much of what Van Til wrote in a systematic way. Yeah. Um, this, this guy here. Yeah, there it is. Me too. I've got it right here. And, and, um, I require that in my, in my class, uh, in my in my second year apologetics class, uh, the interesting thing about that is um, Greg. It took Greg quite a while to get that eventually done because it's a pretty significant piece, and you know, it just takes a lot of effort. The uh, and and um, I was one of the ones who was an editor, meant to be an editor of it before it went to P and R to be published. Mm, okay. So um, the manuscript, the finished manuscript arrived on my desk the week that Greg died um, oh, in wow. the hospital. So providentially, um, it it came out just in time. And I think it's been a very, very useful resource uh, for us in, in apologetics. My, my students, I have them read it every year and they, mm. they uh, are always enthusiastic about what Greg does there. Excellent. I always love those kind of side stories. Oh, that's just very yeah. fascinating. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Scott, for that question. Uh, Random Theology asks, does Dr. Oliphant think presuppositionalism requires a coherentism epistemology? No, I think it's better than that. I think um, uh, a reformed apologetic requ requires a reformed epistemology and a reformed epistemology requires our understanding of our principium cognoscendi and our principium cognoscendi has to be God's revelation. First of all, his special revelation given to us in scripture and then seeing um, all of the world, God's natural revelation by way of scripture. And so if you, if you have that understanding of epistemology, as Van Til says in, in um, survey of Christian epistemology, then you're going to be fine with coherence. You're going to be fine with, with other kinds of epistemological um, structures, as long as they're framed within, you know, correspondence, as long as they're framed within a Christian epistemological structure. So mm -hmm. I, I, would, I will say this, um, and here's something I've been uh, thinking about. I haven't done any, any, any writing on it yet because I'm not sure where I would go, but, okay. you know, there's this, there's this strong um, mood in analytic epistemology um, that uh, knowledge is justified true belief. And so they're, they're trying to figure out uh, what is justification? Um, maybe it's warrant, maybe planning, uh, maybe it's warrant. Um, and then is it, is it true? And then if, if, if it is, then it, you know, it sort of transforms into knowledge. I think they, they, I think they start in the wrong place. I think you've got to start with the knowledge of God that every person has and that, and that belief, whatever you believe is an extension, either antithetical or inconsistency, an extension of the knowledge that God gives you. So you mm -hmm. start as a knower. You don't start as a believer. You start as a knower. So I think it's, I think they've got it turned backwards. I think knowledge is the starting place. And then from that beliefs are formulated. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of work that I think needs to be done there in terms of a Christian epistemology, okay. because the justified true belief structure sort of looks like a tabula rasa or something like that. And then you've got to get somehow the knowledge and, you know, philosophers aren't, aren't quite sure how to do that. And mm. probably because they're, they're not starting in the right place. Oh, that's an, that's an interesting question there. That's a your inter interesting answer. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. We want to go read something now uh, that's related to that. Uh, <laughs> our other bear asks, um, how can we transcendentally argue against a Mormon? How does their worldview not have the preconditions for intelligibility? So that's basically, yeah, presuppositionalism works great when you're talking to the atheist, but what happens when you have the Mormon knock on your door? Yeah, well, see, I think this is where you've got to think about uh, Reformed apologetics a, a little bit more carefully, because Reformed apologetics is really just um, a, another form of Reformed evangelism. It's it's a form that's going to deal with objections. It's a form that's going to deal with real questions that come. Um, but the problem with Mormonism um, is not intelligibility. The problem with Mormonism is it's a cult, and, and it's, a, it's a perversion 
of Christianity. And so what, what, you know, what, so let me just transfer this a little bit. One of the things I did in covenantal apologetics, I did this mock dialogue with a Muslim. Okay. Well, he's got a book and he says, this is the word of God and it's self-attesting. We've got a book and we say, this is the word of God and self-attesting. How do you deal with that? Well, let's talk about what you actually believe. Uh, and, and when you begin to talk about what they actually believe, then you're going to want to try to poke holes in, in what they're saying. I think Jeff Durbin is probably one of the one of the masters at this because he deals with this a good bit. Um, and you try to poke holes in what they're saying in terms of what their own religion holds. Hmm. So so what I was doing with the with the Muslim, the mock dialogue is I, I took an actual uh, Muslim book on on Islamic theology. You know, they're all different like Christians. There's their differences. But I took one particular view. And um, and it was meant to be a rational view. You know, there was a big emphasis on the rational. And once you do that, you're going to have to justify the Quran itself. Is the Quran or the Quran? Is it actually the word of Allah given to you? If so, how did Allah get it to you? Well, it, well, he did it through Muhammad. But how does that word come into time? And there's debate mm -hmm. about that. You know, is, is this eternal? Is it temporal? If it's temporal, they don't have a God who can condescend. So if it's temporal. They're having trouble figuring out how to make that work. So I think in, in Mormonism, I'm not an expert on Mormonism, but the, you want to do the same thing with any cult where you want to get to is Christ is Lord. In the beginning was the word was with God is God. Without that, you're not going to have intelligibility. So you don't have it just because you have a religion. You only have it if you have Christ. And that's where we need to try to help people hmm. to go, we need to help them go. If we're, if we're going to do apologetics in a reformed way, I'm not satisfied with let's sat, let's let's address the issue of intelligibility because the issue of intelligibility is just a segment of the whole sin problem. The noetic okay. effects of sin are are present in every cult. Mm. All right, thank you for that. Random theology says, uh, Eli, can can you have Doctor Oliphant on to discuss theology proper in opposition to the rise of Thomism? I don't know if he wants to come back on. We can talk about that. I don't know if that's a topic that's interesting and of interest to you. Yeah, it is of interest to me. Um, I, so I, I'll give you a brief answer. I think my my pods are about to die, so I might come into the computer here. It might okay. just default to the computer instead of these. Um, so I would I would say this. Um, Obviously, Thomas was a genius. Um, no question about that. Sure. I've never read anything in Thomas that was not said better by some of our uh, best Reformed theologians. So I, I don't I, I would never see it as a place to park. I would see it as a as an interesting uh, research project. Um, I took a course on Aquinas at Villanova years ago just so that I could get it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, and it was it was quite clear to me that Thomas Thomas's overall position is not conducive to reform thinking. There are bits mm -hmm. and pieces you can extract and pull together. So, so I guess my my bottom line is uh, when people ask me about classical theism, my answer is I'm a confessional theist because that's for the church written down specific. Classical is not specific. If it means Thomas, say Thomas. If it means Thomas and Scotus and Occamus, say that. And then let's see where the merger takes place. Sure. It's just a, it's just an ambiguous term that people, you know, kind of getting their schools together and, and, and everybody wanting to, you know, uh, fly the flag. The flag I want to fly is confessional theism. What the mm -hmm. Westminster Confession says, I affirm wholeheartedly every bit of it. And I know what it is and I know what it says and I know where it is. So I don't have to I don't have to say classical. So I think my own view is this this Thomism thing is going to be detrimental to reform thinking and it, it'll take a while to, for that to flesh out, but it'll come. I'm pretty sure. Of that. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Scott Terry, thank you for your $20 super chat that I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Does that go to me, Eli? That, that, <laughs> you come on and you make me money. Look how it works. That's how YouTube works. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate it. But Scott says, Dr. Oliphant, uh, can you explain the Principium Ascendi and Cognoscendi? Uh, did the reform scholastics get this from Aquinas? What's the pedigree of it? And should we Vantillians be principalists instead of presuppers? Oh, real quick, I'm going to interrupt you. I can't hear you. I don't know if when you took off your, your AirPods, you switched to your uh, laptop mic. I still can't hear you. And when you're live on YouTube, you can't go on, you can't go to commercial, right? We're having technical difficulties. No worries. I'll give you a few moments there. <laughs> Hmm. 
Okay. Um, there is a way to um, to to change your microphone to your laptop. Are you using a laptop, Dr. Oliphant? Yeah. Maybe you should sign out and then click the link back in. And there's that little screen that tells you to type in your name. There might be an option to to click on like um, you know your settings and like turn on the um, the laptop microphone. Why don't you try that? And I'll I'll tell a couple of reform jokes while you're gone. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. It's, it's happened before. It's okay. All right. Well, Dr. Oliphant is going to join us. I'm just joking. I have no reform jokes whatsoever. So, uh, but I hope you guys are enjoying this conversation. Um, I'm super excited that Dr. Oliphant was able to come on and he's, um, you know, willing to, to show his face this time around. If you watch the, uh, the, uh, the older episode, uh, it was just kind of like me talking to Dr. Oliphant, but there's kind of this, you know, this awkward, uh, gray icon on the other side of the screen. So um happy he was able to pop in here. So let's see if he's back on here with me now. Let's see if... Can you hear me, Eli? Yes, sir. You're back. Uh, good for you. Thanks. I'm sorry about that. Like I said, what this happens. technology ha is new to me. It My happens. Died, I didn't know where to go. <laughs> if um, I was still Pentecostal, we could just blame it on the devil, but that's <laughs> well, okay. Let's do that anyway. Yeah. So I would... Uh, really good question. Um, I'm not an expert on the pedigree of the Ascendi Cognoscendi. I know the Reformed used it. Likely, it's from uh, medieval theology that the Reformed would have would have put new content, particularly into the Cognoscendi, I believe. Um, and and whenever we think about the two principia of Reformed theology, it's got to be God and 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 the Triune God, not just generic, but the Triune God of Christianity. And Cognoscendi has its focus in Scripture, special revelation but must also include natural revelation because as Van Til teaches us, they have to go together. They're limiting concepts. You, you don't understand one without the other. And it's been that way since the beginning of creation. So sure. I like what he says. Uh, prin principialists, that's much better than presuppositionalists, but you know, some anything almost is better than presuppositionalists. In my view. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Viet Mai says, uh, how does one get better at recognizing their unbelieving friends' presuppositions, central concerns, or fears, so that one can use that to effectively point their friend to Christ? That's an excellent question. How would you address that? It is excellent. And um, let me say, first of all, I'm not an expert at this, but in, in thinking about this, um, I think one of the best ways and as much as I'm able, I've tried to do this, again, not an expert, but one of the best ways to do that is, is to go into almost every conversation um, with the resolve that you're going to be asking a lot of questions. Um, not, not, not in an offensive way, but in, an, in a genuine, concerned way, ask questions about what people are saying and what they mean by what they say. So I've got an example I've given before, a, a, a good friend of mine who's, who's not a believer, he was raised Jewish and, and is not uh, so much anymore, but he, um, he came back from a, a, tr a trip overseas and he was in a country where there was a good bit of suffering. And he, he sort of came up to me um, right away and I said, how was your trip? And he said, you know, finger in the face, he said, your God does not exist mm. because of the suffering I saw. And um, so what are his presuppositions there? So what I said to him was, how do you know that my God is responsible for that suffering? You see what I did there? I went to the epistemological question and I challenged his assumption in his, you know, statement that he knows the God that I believe in, which he doesn't. Now, obviously, there are some things in there that you, you understand why he would he would say it that way. So you could say, well, don't you you know, you can't do that. But instead, what I did is I, I challenged his his assumption that he knew the God. I, he knew as a Christian, he knew the God that I believed in. And I asked him that question, how do you know God I believe in is responsible for that? And he just sort of, he just sort of looked at me and we, and we let it go. A few weeks later, he called me and he said, Look, I want to talk. So, um, so it got to him, you know, it was, it was one of those questions and he wanted to know who Christ was and he wanted to know about his work. And we had good discussions about that. So I think the best way to do this um, is to go into any discussion, not, not in the first place, wanting to hammer home your points, but in the first place, wanting to know what these people believe, why they believe it, and and uh, and what questions they're really dealing with. One more example I think might might be useful here, Eli. Um, 
you know the uh, the testimony of Rosaria Butterfield in her book uh, Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. She was a uh, an activist lesbian teaching at Syracuse University, and um, she was in charge of the gay and lesbian uh, group there. This is before Obergefell, so this is you know back two uh, thousands, early two thousands, and okay. I think late nineties, early two thousands. And uh, she wrote an editorial in a paper against uh, promise keepers. Uh, and and she got a letter from a local pastor after she wrote that. She got a lot of letters. And she said, I had a box on one side of my desk, hate mail, box on the other side, mm. love mail. And uh, she got this letter from a pastor. And she says in her in her book, I didn't know what box to put it in. And, and that that opened up a conversation. And eventually she was the Lord uh, converted her through through the ministry of this pastor. But all the pat not all what the pastor did was and this is the way Rosaria reports it. He asked her three basic questions. Um, how did you come to your conclusions? How do you know you're right? And do you believe in God? What's see, he's challenging her as a scholar. Sure. Give, me the, give me the thought process here of, of how you got to this editorial. And by the way, does God fit into this at all? And it just devastated her. I mean, the spirit took that and just drove it into her heart and, and it got her. So, so I think that's the kind of thing we need to be adept at as much as we're able. And, and I, this is not my strong suit, but I want it to be my strong suit. How sure. to ask the best questions so I can get at what people are really needing to hear. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to just recognize that everyone has presuppositions and then just ask yourself, what is this person presupposing when they say this? One of the ways that I um, that I found helpful is um, watching movies. When I watch movies, um, I love watching movies. I enjoy them for entertainment, but I also uh, try to, in my, my own thinking, identify worldview assumptions in some of the comments they're saying. Um, yeah, and, and it's helpful. You you kind of, um, kind of pick up kind of a, uh, a sense of like, there's something behind what that person's saying. So um, I try to do it with people I'm talking with, although I don't bring it up when I'm talking with people. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to always be pointing out their presuppositions, right. but I do try to pay attention to it. It's kind of like a little mental exercise I'd like to do. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Probing questions is a good way to do it. And like you said, training yourself to think that way when you're reading a, a piece in a newspaper or watching a movie or something like that, what's going on behind the scenes here that makes that statement what it is. That's, right. That's a good practice. That's right. Uh, Scott, thank you again for another $20 super chat. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, Scott asks, Dr. Oliphant, uh, Van Til said Hendrik Stoker was the greatest living philosopher, yet I can't find any of his writings except for his essay in Jerusalem and Athens. Can you comment on Stoker and his influence, if any, on Van Til? Yeah, um, I, I agree with Van Til on that. I think um, I think Stoker's uh, under undervalued and underappreciated. Part of the reason for that is that he's not translated very much. He, he wrote almost everything in Afrikaans. And you know, when I when I meet somebody from South Africa, I, I try to say, could could you not set aside a little time and and, and translate Stoker for us? I think somebody was working on it at one point because I got a, a manuscript in my box and I don't even know who whose it was, and it was translation of, of some of Stoker's material. Um, but the, the essay in Jerusalem and Athens is the best thing on Van Til's uh, epistemology written from a, a theological, philosophical perspective. It's a bit dated. He, he interacts with uh, Doiverd and others, and, you know, Doiverd's not as relevant today. But Stoker, I think, has a better view on transcendental relative to transcendent, which was the big debate between Van Til and Doiverd. Stoker has a better view on that, uh, much better than Doiverd does. He's got another essay might be useful to you in the in the Doiverd Fest strip, which I think is called something like the idea of a Christian philosophy. And uh, the title of his essay is on the contingent and present day Western man. And he goes a little bit into the unity, diversity, equal ultimacy issue from his own perspective. He was kind of philosopher of science. Some people uh, thought he was uh, too influenced by Husserl and phenomenology. I don't I don't see that necessarily in what he's written, but. I hope that uh, some of his material will be translated. More of it will be translated and he'll be uh, he'll be used more because I think he was a just tremendous thinker and a very, very useful assessment overall. I don't have complete agreement with Stoker's Jews and Athens essay, but overall, very useful assessment of what Van Til was up to. And, and, and Van Til responded basically saying, hey, um, Dr. Stoker, that's your field. Go after it. Yeah, you know, keep at it. Keep doing what you're doing. Hmm. Thank you for that. One more by Scott Terry. Thank you so much for that last $5 super chat. You're really generous this live stream. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, he asks, um, or atheist ask, 
If everyone knows God, why are there passages like 1 Corinthians 8, 7, which say some people do not know God? Now I have 1 Corinthians uh, 8, 7 here in front of me. It says, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. So what about those passages of scripture that seem to suggest that not all men have a knowledge of God? Yeah, uh, good. And, um, you know, there's first Thess, uh, first Thessalonians 4, 3, maybe where Paul says Gentiles who do not know God. So even Paul, who says in Romans 1, everyone knows God, says in uh, first Thessalonians, Gentiles do not know God. So so how do you understand that? Well, if you're if you're a skeptic and cynical, you say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. But uh, we don't we don't understand that at all. Um, and people don't treat literature that way, typically. So we have to contextualize what's being said. And what, what Van Til liked to say is that there's knowledge of God, and then there's knowledge of God and loving God, a loving knowledge of God, or what we would call simply conversion. So there's knowledge of God by virtue of God's own activity. There's a rejection of that knowledge by virtue of unbelief. And so you can say those who are outside of Christ do not know God because they do not love and honor God. So the knowledge of God that they have, they don't have because they've done anything. Once they do something, they become agnostic, not knowing, and they won't know truly until they're renewed unto knowledge, Colossians 3.10, by virtue of, of Christ's work. So you have to take those passages in their context and recognize theologically what's going on there. There's a knowing and not knowing. Hmm. All right. Just a few more questions. I do, I do want to respect your time. Uh, you're doing great. I hope you're uh, not fatigued from all these questions. I'm sure you're I doing fine. There. I'm just glad you didn't make me do this at nine at night because I'd be snoring. <laughs> all right. Well, excellent. Uh, here's a good question uh, by Simon. Thank you so much for your question, Simon. Most people say God and politics must be separated. I always reply by saying that it isn't true because God is the precondition for politics. How would you respond to this question? Yeah, well, it's a Big question isn't a complicated question. And my my response would be that um, Christ is Lord over everything. And that if um, if politics was to be what it ought to be, it would be Christian politics. Um, if if everyone in Washington was to be what they ought to be, they would all be Christians ruling um, in in the in the political sphere. Uh, so so I would you know, I'm, I'm sort of with with Kuiper here. Um, uh, Christ rules over all, and everyone has the obligation to submit to that rule, and there will be a time when every knee will bow. Some will do it unwillingly, um, but every knee ought to bow now, and those knees that do bow, should um, those people should do their work in conformity with what Scripture requires of them. Hmm. All right, and uh, two more questions, and we'll wrap things up here. Uh, Felix um, asks, Hello, Eli. I love Jesus slash God because in his love, he is also weird, crazy, and dangerous. We must all be more like Jesus. Is this a theologically sound or true thing to say? That's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Um, I don't like the way it's put, but I could I could finesse it if, if I needed to. Um, of course, God is love and he loves us and he loves his people. Uh, I wouldn't want to say God is weird. I think that sounds a little bit uh, irreverent. I would want to say that God is wholly other and different from us. He's infinite, eternal, unchangeable. We're finite, temporal, and changeable. Um, his love is perfect. Our love never is. Uh, I wouldn't want to say he's 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 crazy or cr crazy. You know, why would you? What's your standard there? That that sounds to me to be ridiculous. Uh, dangerous. Um, well, you know, you could you could use C.S. Lewis um, there. Uh, you know, is 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 Aslan safe? No, he's not safe, but he's very good. Hmm. Um, God is very good, and he's not safe in the typical way that we think about it, because he, he will come to judge the the quick and the dead. And so that's why it's our responsibility as people made in His image to bow the knee and repent and submit to Him and and uh, experience the love that He that He gives in Christ. So I, I guess I'd have to quibble with some of the language here. I think we have to be a little more careful in the way we and the way we describe God, the way we think about him. All right. Thank you for that. And one last question, just out of respect for Dr. Oliphant's time. I do apologize if I missed your question. Uh, I got to scroll through these individually and there's, there's a lot of comments here. So uh, we'll leave this as the last question. And uh, sorry if I, if I skipped you. Um, Matt uh, pa uh, Paisley asks, 
Can you speak to the concern some raise as to how crimes against God in the temporal time can fairly translate to an eternal punishment? Any recommendations to further study this argument? I suppose temporal crimes warrant eternal punishment. How is that fair? Where's the justice in that? Yeah, well, um, the, uh, the reality is um, crimes against God are sins against God and violations against God by those to whom God has given life and who he's made in his image for eternity require an eternal punishment. Um, if we weren't in his image and if we weren't going to exist in eternity, then things might be different in that hypothetical possible world. But the way that God has made us, once we exist, we will never not exist. We will exist in this world and we will exist in another. And there won't be a time from that point forward when we don't exist. And because God has made us fundamentally as his image and his covenant creatures, uh, our sins against him are sins against an infinite eternal God. And so they require a, an eternal punishment. And that's, that's God's justice um, meted out on his creatures. It's always meted out on all of his creatures. For those who are in Christ, it's meted out on his son. It's not passed over. It's still meted. For those who are outside of Christ, it, it must be meted out on themselves. Mm. Excellent. Now, I do apologize. I want to squeeze this one last question in because I think it's really practical. And so uh, here's oh. a question by Samuel uh, Haupt. Um, how would you approach those who are apathetic and indifferent? It's very common in college campuses here in Europe and elsewhere. I think that's a really good question. And, and we'll end with that one. I do, too. And, and again, I'm, I'm not the um, you know, I'm not the expert on this. I have dealt with people like this. And what, what you will find, uh, given time is the apathy is just more suppression of the truth. It's a cover. Um, there, there are things that they're going to be extremely passionate about if you take the time to get to know them, to ask questions, to probe a little bit. Mm. Uh, no one can be truly apathetic. Apathy is just a cover for the things you really care about that you don't want to show. Mm. And the reason we know this is because Paul tells us, that, that, you know, other, other reasons, but we, Paul tells us in Romans, uh, 125, that people worship and serve some God or gods that are created if they don't serve the true God. And that worshiping and serving is passionate. So there's passion internally that's being suppressed, covered up, uh, hidden. And, and the best way to do this, if you're able, if the Lord allows in his providence, get to know these people, talk to them, find out what they're passionate about, and then you can begin to probe why they might be passionate about that. Mm -hmm. And not something else. You know, the great example that I've, I've used before, Francis Schaeffer had this conversation. I think he was on a ship at some point and he was talking to a man who was a materialist and uh, they were talking about materialistic philosophy and uh, and Schaeffer. And he said, I, I must go now. It's late. And my wife waits in the cabin. And Schaeffer uh, asked him, he said, before you go, I, I want you to think about this question. Uh, on what basis can you know that you love your wife? Uh, so here's a man wanting to be consistently materialistic, and yet he has this love for his wife. That doesn't fit in a materialistic universe. Apathy won't either. And so you can try to get behind that by seeing what people are not apathetic about. Maybe their spouse, maybe their children, maybe their, you know, all these sorts of things, maybe their job. And then you can begin to probe why those things are so important. It's a great question. There's no there's no silver bullet here, but I think, again, questions are the best way to go. Sure. Excellent. I'm speaking with Dr. Scott Oliphant of Westminster Theological Seminary, professor of apologetics and systematic theology. Um, judging from a lot of the comments here that weren't questions and didn't get shared on the screen, uh, a lot of people are enjoying this conversation. So thank you so much uh, for listening in, folks. And thank you so much, Dr. Oliphant, for uh, giving me one hour and 33 minutes of your time. It's wow. very generous of you. <laughs> well, happy to do it. I'm sorry about the glitch, but I'm glad we got back on track there. I'm glad you can hear. No worries. No worries. Well, folks, if you really enjoy this content, please uh, do me a solid and share these videos. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And um, I'm trying my best to keep the podcast updated. So what I do is I take the audio from these interviews and I transfer them over to iTunes. What really helps is if you go over to iTunes and write a very brief review as to uh, what you think about the content and just share it. This is how we get uh, all of this great apologetic content out there. I think people can benefit greatly from the sorts of conversations that um, that we have here with various scholars and apologists. So thank Are you, you so much. Twitter, Eli? I'm sorry. Are you on Twitter? 
I am on Twitter. Yes. All right. Well, again, I'm no expert, but I have an account that was set up for me years ago. So I'll have to go on and find you and follow you. All right. Well, well, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. And I just, I, I don't know, perhaps it's a total depravity. I just created a TikTok account. Wow. <laughs> well, you're waiting on me. I'm going to give it a shot with some, some apologetic content. We'll see what happens, but yeah, well, um, keep it posted. That's interesting. All right. Well, thank you, you so much. Dr. Some, I get some FaceTime in China, huh? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Oliphant. And thank you so much everyone for listening. Thank you for the super chats. I appreciate you guys until next time. Take care and God bless. Bye-bye.